Okay, so we will um, start today um, our lecture. After the lecture, okay, we will talk about it, okay. So, we are talking about Java uh, object oriented. So far, we cover how to organize your Java program. We discuss about object in the Java class and the class constructor and different type of constructors, default constructor, no argument constructor, and customized constructor. And what is the purpose of having a constructors in your class? Is to initialize the object on a valid state, okay? Normally, to create an object from the class, you need a constructor. If you want to prevent creating an object from your class, you provide a constructor, an empty constructor, but you make it private constructor. So no one can create an object from your class. Then we discuss uh, methods. We say that we cannot define a method separate from the class. We need a class, and inside this class, we define the method. So you cannot define anything on the Java without class. So the fields live inside the class. The method are live inside the class, everything within the class. So you have to decide first the class, then inside the class you define your fields, and then you define your methods. And we discuss about the signatures, the basic implementations, and we say that is the same method can be implemented in different way. Okay? And which is the best way? The efficient way which less number of codes. No redundancy in your implementations is very important. And we discuss a very important concept about the Java is passed by value. We said that we use the value for the reference and also for the primitive type. So whenever we have a primitive attribute or a primitive fields, we store the actual value in that location of the memory. But if we have a field that is a reference, like a string, we store the address of where the object is live in the memory. And we share this value with the method when we call using the object as an argument. Java documentation, we discuss how we can document our uh, method by listing the description of the method, any parameters we are using inside the method, determining the retain type, any preconditions for this method, any post condition for this method, and also if our method throw any kind of exceptions. And this Java documentation is very important. It generates an HTML readable file that we can share it with the client or anyone who is going to use our method. Now, last time we go over Java exceptions in details, how we can raise an exceptions, how we can catch the exceptions, how we can add finally as an optional blocks in the try and catch, okay? And we saw different example of the exceptions. And also we discuss about design by contract when we uh, try to enforce the precondition, how we can enforce the preconditions that are listed on the ABI by checking them, raise the exceptions, or stop the program from the executions, or execute the program with this functionality and how we can enforce the post conditions. And also, we discuss a very important idea about what we call a class invariant, where is something that is actually true for this class and for all the objects from this class over all the time. Like a student GBA, we discussed this example. We said the fact about student GBA, it should be greater than zero. Whatever is you are creating an object, you're creating a new student, the student, new students are registered in the university, always the GBA for this student should be greater than zero. This is what we call an, as an example of class invariant. So today we uh, stopped last time about uh, introduction to testing and J units and testing strategy. And now you are on the state. You create your class, you define your field, you already implement your methods, you look at the ABI, you take care of all the preconditions, both conditions on the implementation. 
Now it's time to do some kind of testing. Who gonna do the testing? The programmer should write testing. A few of the programmer do this. Why? Because I'm so busy. As a programmer, I just finished reading the ABI, taking care of all the preconditions, boss conditions, class invariants. So I'm so busy to write the testing. So someone should write uh, the testing for me. Uh, it's too difficult to test my program. How I can test my program? It's so difficult sometimes to create a test scenario for your applications. Let's go deep on the, the testing. Testing code is a very important part on the development. It will try to catch any defects inside the implementation process, anything you miss. Okay, while you are trying to implement uh, your method, it's just trying to catch that part. Now, this thing using the main method, and this is the technique we used on the lab test zero, when we provide you with the methods, and we ask you to implement this method, and we provide you with the main method that can test your applications. For example here, this is the main method, and inside this main method, we define A, P, and C as a two, three fields of type N, and we try to test the average. We say, let us try to test the average. We send them to the method of the average, and we calculate the average. And also, we create a new array list, and we send three and five. We store them inside the array list, and then we try to swap these two element inside the array list and also test the method of swap. We test it by looking at two strings. We try to print the, the representation of the swap result. So as you can see, on the main method, we define the fields for the average and we print the result. So the user who's going to execute the main method going to look at the result. Oh, I send one and one and one, so I should expect one as a average, okay? Then once it's expect one, this, it says, oh, the average is implemented correctly. So this is the test using the main method. So we test the average method here, and we test the swab method. Also, you can see this is an example where we test all greater than. So we create a method called all greater than. We send the array list to this method. And we say, uh, give me all the element inside this array list that are greater than 5. So we add 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 to the array list. And then we try to test if the, our implementation is correct. The second part is about trying to convert to integers. So we send 1 and 2 and 3. We would like to convert to the integer. So we're supposed to retain 123. Okay? So this is the main method. It's about writing the, all the tests, one after the another, and we rely on the executing the main functions on this class, and then generate the result to see if this is valid. Here we test all greater than. Here we test two integers to convert 123 as an output. You can see here on this slide, number nine, we have the average, one, two, and one. So all these three integers are sent to the average method, so I should expect the result as one. And in the second line, we have a swap two. We have originally three and five. We swap three and five, okay? And all greater than, we have four, five, six, seven, and eight. We send five. We need to retain all the elements inside this list. Greater than five, we retain six, seven, and eight. And also, we have 1, 2, and 3 on the last line, and we send it to two integers. We need to convert it to integer value, and the return value is 123. So everything it seems perfect. So we use the main method to test our implementations. And this is the tradition way to test your code. There is a disadvantage of using the main method. Someone has to examine the output, as we just did. We look at the output, and we make sure that the output as the, we are expecting to have the value 1, if we send the average 1, 1, and 1. So someone should sit and examine the output and determine if there is a failure or not. 
all the tests as a one method. So you have to finish implementation of the main method. If you are implementing the main method and there is a compilation error at the last line, you cannot execute it. Even if the beginning test for the average or for the swab is correct, but for the all greater than method is wrong, you cannot execute the main method. You cannot validate that average and swab is correct, but there is a problem on the syntax error on the all greater. It's the same thing also. If you have a runtime error on the all greater, the computer will stop. So all the tests will run at once as a one unit. Okay? And you have to finish all the tests. They cannot run independently. There is no easy one way to pick I need to test only the average other, other than you have to create a new a class with a new method, main method inside it, and you test only the average. So you, every time you need to test the method, you have to create a new main method, okay, for that. There's no way that say, I want to test only the average uh, right now. I don't need to test that swap. Yes, you can think about I need to comment this part of the code. You have to do it manually. Now, we come to the main topic is JUnit, is a, a unit uh, test frame. And we actually use this JUnit test frame on the lab zero. So in the lab zero, most of you have developed an implementation for some methods and rely on the JUnit test that we provided to you. And we tell you these are the basic JUnit. Hopefully, if you, you succeed to run these JUnit, all of them successfully, most likely, you will have c correct grade or correct result or correct implementation, full grade, whatever you want to say. But let us say correct implementation. If you run these J units successfully in the lab zero, you have a correct implementation. Now, let us see that more is someone defined the J unit. This is from the J unit uh, in action uh, book is the JUnit is to examine the behavior of distinct unit, which is mean by that is a method, a single method. You want to test only a single method, you can use the JUnit to implement and test the behavior of this uh, method. Let us now see how we can write the JUnit test. So we need, we are working with the Java, that means we need a class. We cannot write anything without a class. So we need a class to write the test. And we need to import JUnit library, OK? Because we need to rely on the JUnit test. And JUnit library is filled by the Java technician or expert who already come across many options that you can use during the test. So we need to do that. Now, we rely on the clips as a development tools. And actually, Eclipse can do all this for you. Just right click, pick whatever you class, you create a class, pick that class, right click on that class, and then say Java JUnit test cases. It will create the class for you. It will import the JUnit library for you. And will it provide you, even will give you the choice to list all the methods inside your class to which one you want to test. So it will create a test unit for that method. If you leave it without checking, it will create an empty file with one simple JUnit test case, and that is fail automatically. What command we can use inside the JUnit is assertion methods. Here we list some of these assertion methods. and. Uh, you can see the name of the method is give you an idea what you, it's really the meaning of that method. As you see, the first one is assert true, and you give a test. This test statement, if you, um, uh, uh, did, did you cover the discrete uh, mathematics in the past? Did anyone you come from that by, as a prerequisite? Discrete mathematics, proposition. Do you know what the proposition is? Is it simply a statement? With, can be evaluated true or false, yes? It can only true and false. The test here on the capital, it's written here in the poll, is a proposition statement. You give it to assertion, a true, and if this test is a true, then everything is okay. 
a fail if the Boolean for this test is false. What you are trying to test here, you give the assertion through some test. This will raise an exception if this test is false. Otherwise, it's true. No exceptions. Okay? So, assert a true will raise an exception if the value for the test is false. Otherwise, there is no problem. What do we, that's why we mean by fail. Fails if the Boolean test is false. If the value for the test that you provided is false, then we raise an exception. Otherwise, there is no problem. You pass the test. The same scenario, but sometimes you provide the test that you are expecting the value for this test should be false. So, you say assert false. I need to make sure this test is false. If this test is not false, that means there is a failure in my uh, implementation. I need to raise an exception or this J unit test will fail. Assert equal. You give the expected value and you give the actual value is calculated. As we saw in the average, we expect to have one. What's the actual value is retained from my method? If they are not equal, then we are failing the test. The same scenario, assert same. In this case, we are using equal, equal sign. There is a lot of difference between equal, equal sign and assert equals. Okay? Remember this, because we're going to come later on, on the next lectures, about compare to. When you create on your own objects, you have to provide the way to compare the objects. That in case, we are using assert equals. On. But now, assert the same, we are using equal, equal sign. That means we are using sometimes a primitive type, assert same. Assert not same, if they are not equal, equal. And assert null, sometimes you send uh, some argument to assert null and you make sure that this argument is not null. And assert not null, if this argument is, is not null, you fail, the same thing. And fail is immediately going to fail. Uh, a beautiful exception here or a beautiful features is all, sometimes all of them are equipped with some message. You can send it to the client when they run your J unit test. So in this case, assert equal, you're going to send a message and some of you already saw such kind of message on the lab zero. So whenever you try to test assert, it will give you some useful message about what is actually is failing. Now, let us see here, this is the JUnit test class. We create a class called test2e test. Normally, any JUnit test where the, the class of JUnit is end with test, like here, test2e and then test. And any test you're going to create, it's a start with test underscore then some name. This is some conventions. Uh, and in here we have uh, annotation at test. This annotation is very important for the documentations that also for the people who are going to read your code. This is a test unit. Okay? You create this test unit. And in this test average, we send A, B, and C. We define them as integer value. And we are expecting the value minus 10 divided by 3. This is the expected value as a double. And also we define an actual value. We call the uh, method that we implement average. And we have delta. This is the delta about the difference between the actual value and the expected value. And we send this to assert equals. And if the expected value is equal to the actual value with some delta, then this test is pass. Otherwise, the test is fail. There is also important note on this slide about import statics. We discussed this on the early lectures and we say when we use import static allow us to use that the statics methods and static attributes without listing the name of the class. So we can use a set equal without putting org dot junit dot set. Okay? So we can use a set equal immediately. Okay? So that's why we use a set uh, import statics. Any questions about this slide? Okay. As we said, this is annotations. 
determine that this method is J-unit test. This is the actual evaluation, determine if the test is fail or not, assert if the expected is equal to the actual with some delta. Now, the J unit will throw an exception if the expected value is different from the actual value with some margin. Okay? You specify that by giving the value for the delta. And as we, you have to focus here, we are raising or throwing an exception if this test assert equal is failing. Now, the J unit will handle the exception and report the failure to the user. Now, let us create a J unit uh, test for the swab. The swab does not retain any value, okay? And the most condition for the swab is to make sure that the array list that you send it as an argument to the swab is the same without modification, okay? I mean, the, the, the leave the, the result, okay? So, the method that modify the state of the argument, okay, uh, is said to have a side effect. Whenever you have the method that modify the argument, we call it a side effect uh, method. So we need to test that, that the argument list has expected a state after the swap. So we, we we're gonna change the state of the argument. We're gonna receive the array list, do the swap, and retain the modify array list after the swap. And this modification we call it a side effect. So as you can see here, we define a new array list called actual. We send minus 99 and 88, we add it to the actual list. Then we define a new array list called expected array list. And we add 88 and minus 99, it's already swapped. Then we call a method, it's called actual, and we swap the actual. So uh, the swap to method retain void. There's no retain for the swap to. The actual is a reference type. So the actual argument will be modified inside swap to and will can see these modifications. So at the assert equals, we're going to look at the two array list and if these two array lists are equal. Now, what is the expected value from the uh, swap is to reverse minus 99 with 88. So we will have 88 as a first element and then we have minus 99. So the general unit will throw exceptions if the expected is not the same as the actual value. Any questions? No, it's, if it's, uh, this J unit is pass, it will just give you the, the, the green, which is you see it in the clips, is a green or the, the test is pass. Even if you run from the command line, it will give you one, t for example, if the, the J unit test or the J unit uh, class, it has only one J unit test like this, just this examine this one, it will give you the, the test is pass without anything. But if there is a failure, it will give you the exception. It will raise an exception and it will report there is one failure on the J unit. Yes. It, it, uh, I don't know if, it, according to implementation that we did for SWAP 2 in the previous lectures, it's supposed to work perfectly. There's no exception. Yes, a green one, and there's no exception. There's no message will be retained to the uh, user if the test is passed, except the test is passed. There's no like a swab is implemented successfully. That's why we have to use a meaningful name for the J unit test. Like this test underscore swab two. That will give us an indication we are testing swab two. Okay? And the J unit test give us an ab ability to what? To test a specific method. Not the same as the main method where you test all the method on one function. Okay, no. The J unit is can test separate method individually. So if the, this test is failing, it will report fail while the average is succeed. So how we, based on the previous example, what's the argument we are passing to the method to determine what type of the J unit that we need to create? 
uh, what the our expected retain value we are expecting after we call the method. Uh, if the method does not retain any value, uh, we need to make sure if the method gonna modify the argument or gonna do some modification on the argument, and that's what we said about side effects on the argument. We define the test case to be more specific for the argument. Sometimes you test a specific scenario. You have your method, you try to test a specific scenario. Uh, So once you specify, like let's say you are testing the average, you send the same value, and then you are going to expect the same value as the retained. So when you specify the argument, what is the expected value? So you have to do your homework to find what is the expected value based on this argument that you provided to the test unit. You cannot test, as you can see, if you are testing a method that's retain a value and you provide the argument, you cannot complete the test if you don't have the expected value. There's no way to complete the test if you missing the expected value. So to be able to write an efficient uh, J unit test, you need to consider the preconditions, you need to consider the post conditions for the method, and if you are throwing any exception inside this method. Uh, so let us see some uh, preconditions. This is uh, an ABI about is between, and we have a preconditions about the minimum value should be less than or equal to the maximum value. So we can write a J unit test for that. And here is the another ABI. We have the precondition as the array list is containing two elements, and also the T should be not null value. So uh, how we can choose the test that should satisfy the, these three conditions. Uh, it does not make sense if you want to test something that violate the, the preconditions or the post conditions, okay? So you have to guarantee there's no violations for the, the preconditions. There's some scenario, we gonna violate the preconditions, but also we're gonna include on the J unit that we are expecting some exception to be waived. So we're gonna test both scenario, violating of the preconditions and also raise the exception later on on this uh, slide. Also, uh, the post condition is about the value when the method is finished. What is our expected value after the method is finished? So, sometimes we, uh, for testing the post conditions, we need to provide more than one test to verify that inside our J unit test. So, not only uh, one assert equal will be sufficient we can provide more than one to test that. For example here, this is a, a, a boss conditions. A true if the value is a strictly greater than minimum and strictly less than the maximum and false otherwise. So we require to test the verify the retained value is true. Then we have another test that is verify the value retain is false. This is another example for our boss conditions. Not only one J unit test will be able to verify this. Uh, the test should not be modified after we run the method. And also that we retain the minimum of two from the list. Uh, sometimes we need to take care of the preconditions. Even if we need to uh, evaluate these preconditions in purpose to raise an exceptions. And we're gonna include this on the J unit. So, ooh, again, the ABI, it should uh, read the ABI to extract all the, the preconditions and make sure we write the required test to violate the preconditions so we are expecting the exceptions. Here is an example uh, about J unit uh, tests that are violating the preconditions, but also we are expecting some exception to be raised from this J unit. If the exception is not raised on this J unit, this J unit will be reported as a failure, J unit test. So you can see here the first uh, J unit test is saying that at the header, and before the header even, at, as a notation, at test, then we put inside the square brackets expected equal illegal ex argument exception to class. So we are expecting 
and this exception to be raised from this J unit test. And what is inside this J unit test is saying that we define a new array list and we send an empty array list to the swab. So we know that as a preconditions for the swab, the array should be not empty. At least we have two elements on the swab to be run the swab method. So in this case, we're going to have illegal argument exception raised on this J unit. And if this exception is not raised or thrown by the swap 2, that J unit test will report as a failure. Look at the second J unit test, throw 2, which is we give an array list containing only one element. So we have array list containing one element, and we send it to swap 2. And there is a precondition of the swap 2 that the array list should have at least two. So as you can see, on these two J unit tests, we violate the preconditions, but for the purpose of testing that our method take care of these precondition and throw an exception if it violates the, the preconditions. Here, the swap to throw an exception because T is an empty, and in this case here, it throw an exception because T, which is the array list, has only one element. How we can choose a typical value or some guidelines to choose the, an argument value for your test list? Uh, there is a, uh, in the course note, which is the, the posted on the Moodle, uh, it's saying that we, this term, if you come across this term, so you are get familiar, is about several test uh, cases. We, they call it test vectors to refer to the collection of the test cases. We call it a test vector to refer for all the J unit tests that you are creating inside the, the file. So it's impossible to test all the possible scenarios, but you try your best to test all the uh, scenarios. That's why also when we provide you with the lab zero, we say we provide you with some sufficient uh, J unit test that is guarantee your implementation is correct, but it's not complete, it's not complete. So, uh, argument, uh, sometimes you need to se select uh, unusual expected value for the argument. If you have like integer, you try to select the maximum integer you possible that user can send it to your method, the least minimum argument. If you have some boundary conditions like minimum and a maximum, you try to select around the boundary, okay? And that's the, the case. And uh, like minimum and maximum, we mentioned this. And sometimes you need to look at the, your method and try to find the value where the behavior of this method is switch. So you select the values at that behavior. Here, for example, is uh, the boundary for the average. We know that this, this constant retain the integer maximum value and integer minimum value. And we try to use these inside the J unit. So we try to test the average at the boundary of the maximum value. So we send integer maximum value as A, P, and C. We define them. And we test the average for A, P, and C. And we expect that the integer maximum value will be retained as an average. So uh, the, the more important thing here is you develop the method. You are more, I mean, the most uh, a person who know your method is you. So you should come up with some set of arguments that really test your method. So if you have some definition for the boundary or some argument, according to this argument, your method behavior will be switched. You try to test these arguments. Here is the example for selecting the boundary for the minimum and the maximum. Here we have the method is between, and we have minimum and the maximum, and then the value. The possible scenario to select the value, for example, send minimum and the maximum, and try to select the value that you are trying to test, if it's between minimum and maximum, as a minimum plus one. Or select the value to be equal to the minimum. Uh, another choice is to select the value to be equal to the maximum. 
Another choice, try to select the value to be maximum minus 1. Sometimes you need to select the minimum is equal to the maximum. Or you set minimum is equal to the maximum plus 1 and you are expecting some illegal argument exception to be raised because we are violating the precondition by the last selection when we said minimum is equal to the maximum plus 1. So the precondition on the method is the minimum should be strictly less than the maximum. And if you select the minimum is equal to the maximum plus 1, you violate the preconditions. And in that case, you are throwing illegal argument exception. So this is an example about some argument that you can select it if you are testing, let's say, is between a uh, method. Now, uh, the, we said about the clips that we have uh, clips as an IDE and we can use the clips to create a JUnit test for us. You can, as you can see here, we have array int list the Java. This is the, the name of the method, the class, and we right click on it and then we select we need to create a JUnit test. And once you did this, it will give you the chance to select the, uh, which method you are you're trying to test. And there is a link here for another university where they explain in detail how you can use the JUnit efficiently using the clips. Okay. As an example, we provide you in this class with public class myDate is a, a, a class we define. And inside this class, as you can see, we have a three fields. And these fields are private fields and they're of type of integer. Now, we have public my date is a constructor, and we identify this as a constructor of uh, three arguments because the name of this is the same as the name of the class, my date, and the access modifier for this constructor is public. That means it's accessible by anyone. The client can access this constructor. If the client can access the constructor, that means the client can create an object from this class. So the client can create an object from my date class. And as you can see the documentation, the constructor take three uh, arguments, int, year, month, and day. And also we mention in the header of this constructor that we're going to throw illegal argument exception. And whenever we mention something like that, we say that we throw the exception. And mentioning this on the header is an optional. You can leave it without mentioning something on the header, and you throw the exception in the middle, there is no syntax problem. Java will not stop you. Okay? Inside this uh, constructor, we have if statement. If verify, we send the year, the month, and the day. If the value of this is false, okay, we're going to throw an exception, a legal argument exception to the user without any message, just we're throwing the, this exception. We're not handling this. So we're not trying to fix what the user is trying to create an object. If someone send, uh, let's say, a 35 the day argument as a 35, we just throw an exception. We're not trying to fix it to make it any day, okay? Also, just any day for the user. And if this successfully, that means the students or the, the client try to create an object with valid or verified year and day and date, so the month we create this year and we assign it to year and this month and this uh, day. And what we call this, the name of the argument is the same as the name of the field. What the term? We use normally a term. Anyone can remind us what the term is? Shadowing? Yeah? So this is the term. When the name of the argument is the same as the name of the field, and we use this in this inside the, uh, the body of the constructor because the argument has more priority than the field to make sure that we are accessing the, the field of this object is be constructed right now. We need the year to be assigned to the argument year. Okay. And this is the, actually the, the body of verify. As you can see, this is a private method. The client 
or of this class will have no idea that we are trying to verify the year and the month and the date before creating the object. So this is a private method, retain a Boolean, and if the year is less than zero, if uh, the clients try to create a negative year, we throw, we retain false. If the month is greater than 12 or less than one, we retain false. If the day is less than one or greater than 31, we retain false. Otherwise, we have a switch statement to make sure we have a valid day in the month. I will leave it for you to read it. And here is the another constructor. We call this is a Kubi constructor. So once you have already an object is created as a my date, you need to Kubi this object. You use this Kubi constructor to use that. And we, need, we don't need to validate the year and the month and the day here because it's already validated because this object is created. We will not be able to create an object if we have unvalid year or day or a month. Now, this is a method, it's public. The client can use this method. And is this method we define on the header uh, throwing illegal argument exception. Again, it's determining on the, ex on the header that you're going to throw some exception doesn't mean uh, 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 what I say is mandatory. No, it's an optional. It's more used for readability. So anyone will read your method, will look at the header, immediately will identify you gonna throw the exception. But actually on the documentation, on the ABI, you will list that you're gonna throw exception. If for example, if the day that you're trying to add is greater than 365 days, you cannot add this day. And I will leave the details for the description uh, in the slide. You can go and look for it. Now, how we can create the JUnit, actually in this class, for this course, we are using JUnit 4 for testing. Uh, there is a JUnit 5. Now it's used some uh, advanced uh, uh, new, but still we can uh, use the JUnit 4 for the testing for this class. So this is a test one. We try to uh, create a day, date, and we add 4 for the day, and we try to see the expected value. As I mentioned, you have to do your homework on the JUnit test. You s decide what kind of argument that you have. Then you calculate what is the expected value. Without having the expected value, you cannot run your method. In this here, we have a three test. If a set is equal for the year and the month and the day. So we can have more one assert statement inside one JUnit test. The test two is trying to add 14 days to the date that we create. And you can see here we throw some, except, uh, some message in case of this test or a set is not equal. In this uh, JUnit, we are defining the JUnit and we are making sure that this JUnit test will gonna throw illegal argument exception and we are violating one of the conditions uh, on the add uh, dates to the, this method. And we send 368, which is greater than 365. So we cannot add day to this uh, date. And this is about the specification of your application. Someone say, oh, no problem. I can add 1,000 day. OK? But this is a different application. Based on our implementation or application, we cannot add more than 65 days to our date that we define. And in this case, if we, this test three, fail to raise an exception, this test will report as a failure. So we suppose that add days will throw an exception. And if this is the case, this test will consider as succeed. Otherwise, the test will consider as failure. Any question? And you can see here, normally we rely on the, the clips. You can run it on the uh, command line if you go online and you can see a lot of documentation sometimes how to run the JUnit test on the command line and see the output and examine this output. But the, J, uh, the clips allow us to visualize uh, when we run the JUnit. You, have, you, you see here that we have 
test one and test two and test three are green and all of the three tests run successfully you have the statistic here and failure is zero and there is no error it's not compiled sometimes but it's, it's supposed to be reported as an error okay uh, it should not give you green. It give you green if you have everything is correct. You have a no error, no failure. You will have a, the green. If you have no error, no uh, failure, and still you don't have a green, that's a, I have to see it. <laughs> okay. So this is a, also a, a method, and I would like you to uh, after the class maybe at home. Uh, try to copy uh, this uh, class, my date, and try to create a, a, a J unit test for this method to test this early and you give a date and you try to see uh, if this uh, date is before some or not. Okay, we'll retain it true if this is before or not. So look at this uh, method and try to come up with some test unit for this method. These are the resources and uh, some references. Uh, it's important for the J unit. It will help you and give you more understanding about how you can create a J unit test. And there is now uh, a specific uh, uh, job descriptions on the company for the software development for a, a, a persons who really dedicated to test software and applications and come up with the new ideas how we, they can test of uh, the uh, application. There's sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, test uh, scenarios is, can be difficult and can, can be sophisticated. Uh, we are in uh, this course, we are just creating a small Java applications and we can test it with uh, JUnit. Sometimes we cannot provide the JUnit to test some uh, application or some uh, 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 Java classes but in company and industrial there's some scenario where you have to install on some hardware you need the software and the hardware to be available to run your test so it's, it's very hard to to come up with uh, the J unit test or but we are discussing the testing uh, test uh, driven and uh, all this is, is very large topics but we are taking only the small part of it that's what I want to emphasize here is using the JUnit test. And it's considered an efficient way for the Java programming using the JUnit test as a tool to test your development. Any questions before we jump to a new topic? It's not a, a new, but it's a repetition for uh, the, about information hiding and uh, encapsulation. Okay. Information hiding is a principle of hiding the detail of the implementations. So when we uh, come up with just a small uh, uh, sentence, is about information hiding. When you, you the first thing comes to your mind, what should I hide? What, what is what we are hiding here? Okay, we we implement the the, the Java and we have uh, the Java file. So what I should hide? I should encrypt this uh, Java file so nobody can read it. Okay. That's one possibility. You can encrypt it uh, and put it inside the jar files. Okay, you can share the jar files to the other people, or so they can only see uh, uh, your method as a black box. They cannot read the detail of implementation. But you cannot hide the ABI. You cannot hide the ABI. You need the other to use your method. So you need to provide them with the ABI. So there's no hidden information on the ABI. What we are trying to hide is the implementation, the actual implementation, the actual if statement, switch statements, how you have the argument, and you start processing the argument to retain the value at the output. Or you're not retaining anything, but you print some messages, or you change the value of the argument. So that is in the body of the method that what we are trying to hide. We're not trying to hide the ABI, because the ABI either will read the ABI and by reading their, our ABI, they will be able to use our method. 
and the ABI contains all the preconditions, both conditions, description of the method, the type of the argument, the type of the return value. If there is any exception, will be raised. All of these details will be on the ABI. We're not hiding the ABI. We now hide the implementations, and we. That's why the, the sentence is coming behind. Hide the implementation details behind a stable a interface. So we create an ABI as an interface for our method. We try to hide the actual implementations of the, our our method. So uh, we not changing the interface. The client always see the ABI, but the implementation on the back end we can change it, but still satisfy the value on the ABI. And that's what we call the, the stable ABI on the Java. Okay? So we hide, we can hide the fields, how many fields we are using, the type of our field that we are using inside the class, okay? And we can make the fields as a private. So the client cannot access the field. The only accessible through get method or set method, okay? And inside the set method and get method, we can provide all the constraint to force the client to pass through these constraints before accessing our fields or before setting our fields inside this class. So, for example here, you remember the point 2 is just two-dimensional point. We have x and y. As you can see here, we have two fields, double x and y, and they have access modifier as a private. When we have access modifier for the field as a private, we make sure the client will not immediately can access this field. So how we can set this field? Can anyone tell us how we can set this field? These are private. The client cannot access them. How we can set this field? Set method. Get method, we can set this field, change this field by get method. Get method, only read. Only read. Set, only write. You are right. We can use set method. Also, we can use the constructor. The constructor is very useful tools to set these attributes, even if they are private, because the constructor will create an object on a valid state. So the constructor, we can use the constructors, and also we can use the set method if the class provide us with some set method, and these set methods are public, can be accessed by the client. So the client cannot access this field. And you can see here, we have uh, default constructors. What is the default constructor? Is a constructor without argument, with zero argument. And you can see the default constructor is public. So whenever the student, uh, I mean the client, is trying to create an object from point two, will also call another constructor. We use this to call, this is a chain of constructor. We call this and we provide zero, zero. What do we mean by that? We set x and y to zero, zero using this. Now this, between the brackets, zero, zero, where we are going to go? To which constructor? The last one or the one in the middle? The one on the middle. Because the one on the middle is two argument constructors. Receive x and y. So this zero, zero will go directly to the custom constructors and will try to call also another method. This dot set. Also we are using this. This is also pointing to the object that is being initialized right now. So we call this set. Now, this constructor will call some other method. Okay? So we're trying to centralize the creation of the objects. And we're going to see now, inside the set, we have some constraint. We can throw exceptions. So we don't need to do the repetition and duplication of the code. Now, the last constructor is called a copy constructor. We just simply take other dot x, other dot y, and send it to this, to the custom constructor to create a new object. So we have set method, and we call it, uh, sorry, accessors or getter method that enable the client to gain access to the private fields. And the name is getter because they are normally they start with get. Get and the name of the field. You can see here is two public uh, get methods and one for get class x and the other one for get y and they are public so the client can gain access to x and y 
we use mutators. We call it mutators because they mutate or they change. Okay, they change the state of the field uh, or sitter method to enable the client to modify the private fields. So normally the sitters start with set. So here we have set x. We simply set the value for x, and as you can see, we trying as much as we can centralize the process. You can see here we don't set x alone. We try to call this dot set, and we calling with the new value of x and the old value of y, and in the side set y. Also, we call this dot set, and we call with the old value of x, but the new value for y. We try to centralize this kind of process of set the field and creation the field. This is very important. So you are, once it's the, the process is changed, you can change only one place. You can change only one place. So in this last one is simply we take a new x, new y, and we set the field. And you can see there is a chain of calling between the methods that will help us about give us the flexibility about changing in case of the future. For example, if someone, for example, give you this constraint, x and y should always be greater than or equal to zero. The only change you need to do is where on this method. Yes. Let's say someone told you always x greater than five. I cannot create an object of two-dimensional point. Always x should be greater than or equal to 5. You don't need to change here or here. You just change on one place. You change on one place to force this constraint. Any question? So we hide the implementation. We define the fields as a private field, and we try to define set and get mutator getter method to what gain access to the private field okay the benefit of hiding the implementations give you the ability to change the underlying implementation without notice the client the client will not notice that you are changing something on the back end let us see if someone decide to use an array Okay, to store the value, not only x and y, he still can succeed without changing the ABI. We don't need to change the ABI. You can see here, we define a private, and we start using uh, an array of double. Okay? Now, once we define a new point, still this 0, 0 is not changed. We try to create, using custom constructors, we create an array of 2, new double 2, and we assign x and assign y. In the Kubi constructor, we still use this dot other x and other y. So we change the implementation on the back end, but still the ABI is the same. There is no change on the ABI. Get x, get y, we change them. And even set x, set y, we change them. But still, the ABI is the same. So. We change how the point is represented, okay, using array instead of two separate fields, okay. We did not change anything on the ABI. The hide the implementation is trying to isolate the client from the actual change on the implementation. So you can change your code, generate a new version of the code, but still you have the same stable ABI, okay. Now, after we finish the hiding the information, and I hope the concept of hiding information is clear for everyone, it, we're not trying to hide the ABI. We try to hide the actual implementations. Okay? We try to uh, avoid give direct access to the field. We try to define the field as a private. We try to define get method, set method, okay, to give an access to the more private field. Now, encapsulation is another concept. We discuss uh, slightly this concept in early. We try to uh, say that we try to create our object and add all the fields and all the methods and ship these objects as one unit. Okay? 
we try to create a protective shield around our objects by equip this object with all the necessary fields, all the necessary methods to modify the status of this field. So we guarantee also the structure of consistency of this uh, objects. Okay, so no one, as I will give the example, no one can enter or exit this room without going through these doors. Okay, so the same thing. You create your object. No one can manipulate the status or change the name field values without passing through some methods that you are creating to do this. So in this case, we have uh, the class, as we mentioned here, we define the public field. So by providing public fields in our class, we breaking the consistency on this class. So once the client have access to the field, they can directly change the field without using the get or I mean set method that you are creating. So you break the consistency. So the client can change the field without using the set method. So yes. You can make the fields as a private. So once you make the field as a private, Yes, they, they, let's say you, you have a class uh, as we have here on this slide, uh, point two. You say point two, A, equal new point two, and you give, let's say, three and five. So you create a new point, you name it A, and A is pointing to this new point. Now you can use A dot, and you can gain access to coordinate, and you say, coordinate 0, coordinate 1, you change it. You can see here on, the, on this, we create point 2 P equal new point, and then we immediately go directly to the field P capital dot coordinate, and we give 0, and we assign 1 to that. So we directly speak and change the value of the field without using any method. So that is, is the problem. That's when we have a public fields available for the client. So you can see here, the client to create a new object and use this new object to manipulate the field without calling any method. You just, this is the name of the field, he used the name of the field and access the first coordinate and set it to one. So apply a proper information hiding by using the private. Okay, apply hiding uh, for the representation for the objects. Make the consistency criteria explicit. Write that on the ABI so the client can follow all the preconditions to manipulate your fields. So the, your, you make sure that the object will never be on an inconsistent status. And uh, also you make sure the class invariant is written clearly. Check the interface and make sure all the export operations for the object are included on the, even in subclasses. But this subclass, we cover it on the inheritance when we come to the inheritance part. So we achieve the consistency of the object by applying the information hiding, make the consistency criteria explicit written on the ABI, and checking the interface uh, for this object with the client. Um, normally, they, uh, they use the, the term interchangeable on the literatures. The, you, you might find some references, they refer the encapsulations and information hiding is the same. Okay, I will stay with the same, okay, because there's a lot of a gray area between these two things. Okay, because what is the information hiding we mentioned? We're not hiding the ABI, we hide the implementations, the body of the method. Okay. Nobody knows how this method. But the encapsulation is simple, it's like this. 
you create let's say you create an object okay and you don't need anyone to touch your object in any arbitrary way you determine the input and output of this object okay let's say you create a car object no one can start the car without a key you have to have the key to start the car yes okay now the car can move forward and backward that is my car I, that i create i cannot go left or right so you create the object you define the fields inside the object the fields give you the status okay and then you provide the method to manipulate with this object that you create and you ship them as a one unit so you create a protective shield around your object no one can touch my fields that is a information hiding yes a throw get method or set method you can access the private field this is information hiding but also you cannot do any kind of behavior for my method without going through my i mean object it's going through my method that is the encapsulation okay so you ship an object as a one unit with all the necessary behavior and the data okay i always mention this is the classroom you created you set the tables you set the chairs no one can move the chairs okay no one can enter only except this and two so this is like what encapsulation so you kind of creating a protective shield around your object you determine the input the, the entry and the exit point what is the retained values all of these inside the method again in the literature there is a lot of overlaps good any questions about uh, information hiding encapsulation now we're going to come yes yeah yes it's something like that uh, now in the immutation here immutable objects you sometimes you create an object immutable object what is coming to your mind when we have this term immutable object you cannot change them so once you create this object it will stay with the same state when we say it will stay with the same state that's mean you set the value for the fields only once and it will stay forever you cannot change it unless you destroy it and create again okay and that's also if you create an object you cannot have a set method yes you can have get method but you cannot have a set method because set method will allow you to change the state of the object so immutable object that can be changed immutable object you cannot change them once you create them you cannot change them it will stay the same you can change them if you destroy them and create them again okay so let us see what is the uh, immutable object is so immutable is read only object is imagine that you have a file in your disk uh, top or you share a file with someone is readable only you can just read it you cannot modify it okay so you cannot change the state once it has been created and example string is immutable objects integers mutable object double is immutable object all the wrapper classes are immutable object you can only change them if you destroy them and create them again okay now the advantage of immutable object it's easy to design easy to implement and easy to use and also you never be an inconsistent status because once you create the object you make sure that the object that you are creating is a valid object in valid state then it will never change after that so no one can put it in consistent state object reference can be shared safely if you have multi threading programming this is a read only object you can share it so everybody can read it from the same file no problem because no one can change it okay information hiding play a very important role in the creating immutable objects all java variable by default are immutable whenever you create a, a, a variable inside the java it's by default is immutable unless if the, the the class is saying this is a immutable you can make sure 
the uh, variable is immutable by making a final keyword with that. But we have to be careful here. We're going to see on the later slides what we mean by that. So, remember the rab class, all of them are immutable object by default. So, byte, characters, short, all these are capitals with I capital, L capital, F capital, double, all these are rubber class they call it. They are objects, it's not a primitive type, they are an object. But this object is provided us from Java. Java technician, they create this rubber class and provide it for us and these objects are immutable. Once you create a byte variable, you cannot change it. The only way you can change it is destroying it and create it again. Okay. So, the string is immutable and I am emphasizing on this one, string are immutable object. String buffer are mutable object. Now, it's happened that uh, students, they feel that they are able to change the string value. No, the Java compiler will understand that you are trying to change the value of the string. So, destroying the old one and create a new one and give you with the same reference. But remember this and keep it in your mind. The string is uh, uh, all the strings that you, we are using inside our code are immutable object. No one can change them. But you can, if you would like to change the string while you are executing your program, you try to use a, what we call a string buffers. So, the only way to change the uh, value is to create a new object that is pointing to uh, the, the, the value. So, again, destroy the old one and create a new one and use the same reference. Uh, there is a, a recipe, we call it, to create immutable objects. What is this recipe is? Do not provide any method that can change the state of the object. That means do not create a, a set method. It prevent the class from being extend. We're going to visit this when we, once we cover the inheritance. Just create a class that you cannot extend it. The third one, use the, all the fields inside your class are finally fields. And make all the fields as a private. And the last one, prevent the client from obtaining a reference to any immutable fields. And this will be revisited again once we cover the compositions and aggregations. Okay? So, this is five step. We consider it as a, a recipe to create immutable objects. Now, this is an example where we have a string S is defined as APC, capital APC. And we try to use the s dot, which is now we have a, an object of type string. We use s, small s, dot to lower. And we try to convert the character inside this string, okay, to uh, have the lowercase, apc. Unfortunately, uh, s dot lower will retain a, a new string, will not change the current status of s. Because S is now is a reference to an object of type string. And what is the status of this object? A capital, B capital, C capital. Now, S dot lower will go to visit this object and try to change the status of A capital, B capital, C capital. Will not be able to do this because the string is immutable object. The only way it will go to another place on the memory, create A, B, C small and will retain a reference to that. Now, to be able to do this and like work around, we try to use this. As reassign the retained object to the same reference. So, we try to convince ourselves we change the status of S. No, the actual behavior that happened on the Java, A, B, C, capital A, P, and C capital are exists on some address in the memory, let's say 600, it will stay 600. And we create another object at address 700 with A, P, and C are small, and we retain a reference again, and we assign this reference to the same as small s. So we convince ourselves that we are changing the status of the object. And we rely on what we call a Java garbage collector to go to the memory 
and whenever you have an object without any reference inside our application, we'll collect it and release the memory for us. Any question? Okay. So, immutable, let's say we have the point two, remember the point two, we try to change point two to create a mutable uh, object from the point two. That's the mean, once you create this point, no one can change this point for you. So, we have to remove the mutators. I mean, what I mean by mutators is set methods, okay. We try to use private and final fields, okay, and these are for the rule two. So, as you can see how we change the attribute right now, still we have the private double X, but we prefix this with final and also look on the name of the class. It's final. So, this class is final. This class is final. This will help us so no one can extend our class. No one can extend our class. This will be covered on the inheritance chapter when we come across that. But now we have private and final. And you can see here we have the constructors and we can set the final value on the constructing phase. So once you are trying to construct the object, you can rely on the constructor to set the final field. Remember this. So the constructor can set the final field. The only method that you can have inside your class to set the final field is the constructor because the constructor will create an object and ship it back to the client. And you can see here that we have a default constructor and we have a custom constructor and also we have a kubi constructor. And all of them are able to set the final private double fields. Okay? Now, you can see here we can get them, we can read them, but no mutators. We cannot have any mutators methods for this class because this is immutable object of type point two. Now, final keyword unchangeable, unable to redefine over or over written. So we can, the final, there is a magic behind this keyword. If you are using this keyword with the class, it do something. If you use final with the fields, it will do something else. If you use the final with the method, it will do something else. So the magic for the final is different where you are putting this final keyword. You put it with the field, you mean something when you are using it here. If you put the final with the class, you mean something. If you put the final with the method, you are meaning something. We're going to see that. So, if you are using the final with the local variables, they are set only once and never change. No one can change them. If you are using these with the attributes and the fields, okay, you can use this with the static fields, become a class constant in that static field. Remember the static fields? That are the fields belong to the class. They're not belonging to an object. They belong to the class. They can access by the class name. And the class, if you use the final with the class, that means you cannot extend and generate a subclass from the final class. And we can go over this again on the inheritance. You, if you are using final with the method, the method is become unable to be overwritten. And this also another issue we can come across over on the inheritance. So, example of finals with a local final integer answer 42, it's locked, no one can change it, okay, with the field, private, final, string, name. Now, again, the question will be raised, how I can set these fields if they are final and private? We can use the constructor to set it, okay? The constructor will help us to set these, even if they are final, and we just saw the example. In the previous slide, we saw that immutable i.2, they have final, private, x, and we are able to set these fields using the constructors. Okay? Here we have a, a static constant. Once we have a static, public, static, final, integer days, we set it only once, and this will be bare class. And if we are using final with the point, that means final class 
we will not be able to create a new extent or a new child from this class. And if we use final with the get x, for example, no one can override this method inside the subclass. And also these, the last two will come across over in the inheritance chapters. Okay. Uh, final will reference. Uh, we will leave this to the next lectures. Okay. Let us stay here. So we have final because this uh, we need to have focus on this. It is very important. Okay. Any questions? After we can come. Yes. Uh, 